back. Welcome to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. This is episode 14. Olympic I'm, edition. Olympic edition. Olympic edition. We actually delayed the start for a little bit so we could catch the uh, men's 400 IM, or I could anyway, uh, watch Michael Phelps get pretty much humiliated by Lakta. That's pretty awesome. Uh, at any rate, I'm your humble host, John Dayton, coming to you from the cozy confines of Shea Kuzabucky. We're at uh, in the backyard again. You can probably hear the crickets, the traffic, the fire. You may hear the the squire of the household himself attempting to get a cigar lit. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's Anthony Kuzabucky here with us. Hello. Providing the uh, the space tonight. And over on the left, we have Carl Maciag. Welcome back. Hello, everybody. And I uh, wanted to start out, you know, we've been begging for uh, people to make contact. And we, we hear from, like, guys that we know all the time. So that's that's sort of, it's nice to hear. They'll, they'll give us some commentary. But we were really wondering if uh, those hits that we're getting on the blog and, uh, you know, the analytics that we see on the podcast, if there are if there are real people out there listening or if it's just bot hits or what. Uh, so anyway, we got a, a nice email from uh, our new friend Eike in Germany. In Deutschland, so uh, greetings to you, Ika, and uh, we'll probably be making contact with you because I've been curious just to know, like you know, what it's like uh, doing what we do in a different part of the world. So maybe we'll get you in, uh, do a Skype interview, or some, send some emails back and forth, and uh, just exchange some views on how stuff is different over there. Danke for listening. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so getting into it tonight. Uh, first topic we had. Uh, you gonna make it there? Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> I'll get it. Burned a forest of matches in the... He's going to set himself on fire. They're free. You, it's all right. You, I'm mine. Jewish. They're free. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. I got I got four packs. Just want to make sure you have I know, I know how I work. Okay. <laughs> uh, so at any rate, um, went down to... Uh, Anthony works... Uh, I work at a church. I'm a full-time audio engineer there. And lighting... Actually, I'm the technical director, but don't tell them. They think I'm just the sound guy. Um... Anthony fills a similar position at the church just up the road, and we are constantly swapping ideas and gear and helping each other out on stuff. So anyway, I'd, I uh, was making arrangements just to drop by and pick up some stuff that I had loaned him the previous week, and he invited me to stay for lunch. I, I guess they had some burgers on the grill. So we wound up uh, sat at a table with a bunch of other people who were trying to be really nice and introduce themselves and, and like be interesting <laughs> conversation. All, all, all of these people are uh, part of a program called Teen Challenge, which is a bunch of um, drug addicts in recovery. So it's it's like it's like NA, I guess, mm-hmm. instead of AA. But they're they're all pretty nice guys, they play a lot of basketball and yeah. uh, they move some stuff for us, which is which is nice. Right. So they were trying to strike up, you know, some conversation and we just weren't having it. We were all <laughs> we were all talking about phase <laughs> just, st- just talk about math for a little bit, and they stopped listening. Right. What it comes so down we, to. Yeah, we, they, they were kind of... I, I saw their eyes just glaze over when we started trying to compute the wavelength of a, a 250 hertz sine wave and figure out how much <laughs> we needed to shift it to correct our phase issue. Uh, but at any rate, the situation was uh, Anthony had recorded a, a band, and specifically a drum kit, in his same space, same snare, same mics, same technique, same game structure that he always does, and was just having no luck finding the meat, couldn't get any beef out of his snare drum sound. Uh, so we got to talking about it, and I said, you know, you know, it's still there if you solo it. You know, maybe the, the overheads are out of phase, or the, the tom mics needed to be gated down harder. And what it really came down to is just there was some weird relationship between the top and bottom mics. Something was just enough different from last time. Uh, so we said, all right, well, you know, if you're th- throwing EQ at it, you're not getting anywhere. If it's like spitting in the ocean, then it's got to be a phase thing. So we started figuring out, all right, if you're looking for somewhere between 2 and 250, the wavelength on that is going to be about 4.5 to 5.5, 6 feet. So we started converting that to milliseconds and figuring how much we'd have to shift one of those tracks. Uh, we decided on the bottom track, bottom head, or mic, um, how much to shift that to get it to stop canceling out the meaty sound, the 200 to 250 hertz sound that and, the top end was getting. And, and just for, for technical basis, what we were using, um, what I use for recording right now is um, on the kick, a, a Beta 52 and a Beta 91. On the snare, on the top, I use an Audix i5, and on the bottom, I use a Shure SM81. On the toms, I use uh, Audix D2 and D4, depending on the tom. 
And uh, for ride symbol, I undermike it. I use a Beta 57A. And for overheads, I use Sure KSM 44s. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I've used the same miking technique for, for about a year now. I've got low ceilings, but they're, um, I guess, they're, they're called architectural tiles. That are supposed to absorb a lot of the sound, which is nice, but at the same time, I don't get a nice room sound, so I have to add that in afterwards. We should change those over to the. Well, we have to be careful what we change them over to if it's not fire rated. <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe we can find you something nice. <laughs> there, so, uh, was, and it the same, was it the same snare drum? Uh, same snare drum. I've used. I've got for snare drums for recording. I've got an old. I think it's it's a 1960s something Gretsch, three and a half inch. Uh, piccolo snare that doesn't sound like a piccolo snare. Um, a Ludwig Superphonic six and a half inch by fourteen. A Pearl Master Custom six and a half by fourteen floating head tom, or I'm sorry, floating head snare. And a uh, a Sonar Force three thousand six and a half by fourteen Birch snare. Um, and on this particular track, I think we're using the Sonar. Drum, we wanted, a, we wanted a little bit more of a beefy sound, but we couldn't get it. Like it, it, it's, it came through like when I, when I, uh, when I sound checked everything before we started recording. Top mic sounded good, solo that switched. Bottom mic sounded good. I was getting enough, enough snap out of it. Um, but after that, like when I added the whole kit in, the room mics and everything, it just, it just sounded wimpy. There, like I, I, I figured it was something that I could fix and post. So I wasn't super worried about it because I knew the snare sounded good. I knew the mics were okay. Um, but I just, at the time, I couldn't get a nice, solid drum mix. So I, you know, I beefed up, um, I beefed up the preamps. I had a John's Joe Meek uh, twin Q on the kick out mic on the Beta 52 and the top snare mic, the Audix i5. And usually that's been an awesome combination. I've never had any phase issues, any delay issues with that at all uh, for other stuff I've recorded, but for this particular kit, um, usually I would use a, a Gretsch Renown Maple for recording with four, I'm sorry, five floor toms, uh, to a 10, a 12 on the rack, and then a, a 12, a 14, and a 16 on the floor. Uh, same mic configuration and everything, and never had a problem with it, uh, but but for some reason, this this instance even though I had everything marked out with tape on the floor where everything was supposed to go, um, it just wasn't working this time. And that's that's where, you know, John came by and, and we started working around uh, delay issues and phase issues. So what the uh, the concept that we were going for um, in the pure physics explanation of it is, uh, if you're looking for, let's say we're talking about a 200 hertz sine wave, because uh, that's what the math we were doing was was applying to. If you have two sine waves, um, oh gosh, this is going to be a long explanation. I don't want it to be. <laughs> this is an advance. This is the deep end, kids. Um, what you do when you mic a, a snare drum is you mic the top head, and that mic is in, I'm not going to say phase, I'm going to say polarity. It's it's wired straight. The bottom head, because that, that bottom head is, like when you hit the snare, the top head starts out traveling away from the diaphragm of the mic. And that's your in in phase or in polarity, we should correctly say, in polarity signal. The bottom head, because the air inside the drum is, is pushing it, winds up traveling toward that bottom head mic first as its first motion. And and usually just throwing the phase on that is if it if it doesn't sound right with everything in phase, usually just flipping the bottom head on that is is enough to straighten it out and get everything you want. Just like if you got two kick mics, you throw the inside mic. Um, and you get your nice, your nice punch right. out of it. So, uh, sound guys say phase because it's it rolls off the tongue a Easier, little nicer yeah. than polarity. But um, what we mean when we say flip the phase on a mic is press the button that inverts pin two and pin three. You reverse the right. signal so you, that you it throw is, it 180 degrees. It, well, it's not 180 degrees though. It's electrically yep. <laughs> reversed. Yep. But phase, <laughs> kids. I lose, I lose here. Phase, Sorry, phase is dependent on frequency. So what is out of what is 180 degrees out of phase at 200 hertz is what only 90 degrees out of phase at 400 hertz and 45 degrees out of phase at 800 hertz. Am I doing that right? I don't know because those are octaves. 
Oh, oh. my. <laughs> we'll have to dig into that deeper. Right, right in. If we're, we're getting, we're if getting, we're wrong. The thing is, we yeah. don't usually go that far with the math. Right. But what we did was we figured, okay, the the bottom mic at. No, it, I'm sorry to interject. No. If they're octaves, it would be half of the wavelength, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it, that's negligible. So if 400 is 180, 200 would also be 180. It's just two complete wavelengths. That's all. For octaves, right? Right. Right, so for the octaves, it's the same. Right. For, all right. Well, at any rate, said all that to say this. <laughs> phase is dependent on frequency. Um, and it's it's really, it's fairly easy to figure out for sine waves. I mean, if you want to try this, uh, put up a 1K sine wave in your DAW, put up the same file on an adjacent channel, set them for the same fader settings, gain structure, and everything, uh, and toggle the polarity switch and watch your signal go completely away. <laughs> And then, so that's polarity. Then throw on a delay, or if you have a, a phase uh, plugin you can use, start shifting w one of those, uh, and you can see how you'll get partial cancellation. Now, with complex waveforms, like a snare drum, which is not a sine wave, um, although there are heads vibrating in there, so there is some sort of you know well, sinusoidal it's a lot of sine waves. function, but it's also a complex waveform. You've got the wires on there. So the, the waveform in total is more complex, and it's not like a continuously electronically genera generated sine wave. It's also decaying, and what the top mic and the bottom mic are hearing is decaying differently, which is why we, we only started out by doing the math to figure out, like, okay, well, if we wanted a, a complete 180-degree flip, we could just hit the polarity switch. Right. But we knew we just wanted a partial shift, so we said, all right, well... If we're looking at about four and a half to five and a half milliseconds, try, you know, shifting that bottom track three milliseconds and see if it makes a difference. Right. And it did. Um, we were also double checking ourselves, making sure that we were, we soloed just these two channels to make sure that it wasn't something as simple as, oh, the toms need to be gated down better, or we had a phase issue with our overhead mics. Um, so I think the, uh, this is getting to be a long story. What, it, what finally wound up solving the problem was uh, both mics in polarity with yep. nine milliseconds of delay, or roughly, uh, what it did was shift that mic about seven feet away in electronically, um, right. not in terms of level or actual distance, but it, it put it electronically about seven feet further away, um, and that enabled him to start touching that that two two fifty hertz and region. It, it just it really beeps up the track in general. Like it, it's something you know the the. The particular track that I've been working on, um, the guy is a big fan of the 80s. He loves the super gated Phil, Philip Helms uh, Tom tracks. He loves the sound of the snare, and I, I'm a big fan of it too. Like I, I like a big, beefy snare. That, that was the era of feeling the, the kick and the snare in right. your chest at concerts. Right, exactly. And that, it's not a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I was born in 1988, so I didn't get to catch a lot of that. My, my dad, I grew up on. ZZ Top's Eliminator, Eliminator album, mm -hmm. but uh, that that kind of stuff like it's still still today drives music. If you got a nice punchy kick and nice thick snare, that that's what'll carry the music more than big giant tom hits. You know. Yep. So let me propose this then. Since we live in this digital age where we can literally time align everything. Would it make sense to pick an imaginary point at the drum kit, let's say the drummer's head, yep, and then measure the distance from that point of the drummer's head to every microphone and time align it to that zero point? Hmm. That that would make sense. I only have forty hours in a work week, though. <laughs> well, you <laughs> that, don't. You don't necessarily. You don't necessarily have to do it. While the drummer is sitting there, you could literally realign. create that point easily, measure it, and then throw three and a half on the kick drums, and then yeah, you know whatever it ends up break. being. You know, I wonder if anybody is doing that. Hint, hint. Let us know. Is that yeah, probably? Please, I, I know. Just let us know about the, that. The big dogs are using micro delay on everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, taking guitars direct and micing them and uh, who's it? Radial makes a box specifically for doing that. A lot of digital yep. consoles, even cheap ones, have it built in so that you can precisely align 
uh, a direct signal with a mic signal or get two mic signals where, uh, you know, the, the quick solution for this that guys have done for decades is if you're putting two mics on the same guitar cabinet, just have them both touching the grill cloth, then they're right. they're both in time with each other. But, but um, what if the diaphragm is farther back in the capsule? Right. Then you still have that little bit of micro delay, so you could, you could move one capsule a little bit. Or what if you're using a dynamic mic on the grill and you have a ribbon mic or a large diaphragm condenser that you don't want right next to the cone, so you're putting it a couple of feet away. Um, yeah. so, and that's, that's where this time alignment thing comes in. But the real thing I want to get down to is whatever method you're using, um, a lot of people sort of miss the boat here, and you hear it. You hear the same sort of thing where guys will quantize their drums or they'll go in and, and massage them by hand, use beat detective or, or cut and move and chop. Um, you can really suck the life out of something by trying to make it perfect. Right. Uh, you know, the, the phrase I keep hearing is, uh, you know, you wouldn't auto-tune Sinatra. So, you know, why would you... Uh, going for perfect can really suck the life out of something. So if you do sit down, do the math like we did. But what it really came down to is... Once we were on to that this was a phase thing and we kind of knew what neighborhood we were hunting around in, um, we didn't spend a lot of time hunting for the house number. We just waited until we smelled dinner that we liked cooking and went in there. Yep. Um, you know, shut the eyes, use the ears, turn yep. the monitors up, feel around for it. You know, uh, I talked last podcast about setting uh, threshold and ratio on a compressor with two of my fingers while I'm just watching the band play or even yep. with my eyes shut. And sometimes being very surprised about what was the juice setting. Um, so it's it's good to know all this little behind the scenes stuff and your physics and your your phase and your electrics and all that stuff, your signal routing. But really, what it comes down to is, you know, once you figure out how to address the problem, uh, does solving something mathematically make it sound better? And if it doesn't, you have to not be afraid to keep fishing around until you find what does sound good. Because ultimately, the people listening to this record don't care how many sheets you filled, how many right. scratch pads were burned up in the pursuit of a good snare sound. They just want to know that the snare sounds good and it makes them dance. Really, that, this whole time alignment thing has been something I've been pursuing quite a bit um, in system design. And that whole, you know, having a reference point um, for delay times is really important. So if you're you know, putting in a new rig or retrofitting one. Um, make sure you have a DSP with a little bit of delay horsepower so that you can, you know, match things up. Would it kind of nice? Would it make sense? Maybe. I mean, I, I haven't tried it personally, but even in a recording setting, maybe throwing a lav on a drummer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and, and basing off of that as Absolutely. opposed to right. Like I've been, I've been working mostly off the kicking snare because that's. That's pretty central. Like that's that's what's driving music in general. But if we, you get a, a a lav mic and you delay off of that, mm -hmm. um, and you get a nice, you know, you, you can delay everything off that because that's what they're hearing. You delay that off of the whole track in general, whether you have latency issues or not. Well, then you can use that lav or not. Right. In the finish exactly. I mean, yeah. well, uh, plenty of times you can you can get a great, and it's a live sounding feel. It's a jazz sound. It's a fusion sound. Right. It's not the rock sound. Um, but it's it's a cool sound to hear exactly what the drummer's hearing through a lav mic, and that'd be an easy way to line it up. I mean, you talk yeah. about hours in the week, it, all you got to do is pull up that lav track and say, okay, well that's a tom hit. Find the tom track, slide it back a few samples, slide it up a few samples until it lines up right. with what that Di lav mic was hearing. Digital and, tape measures aren't that expensive to like if you if you really want to get into it, mm -hmm. um, and just you know have your drummer sit there and hear what he's hearing off the, the delay that you're getting from sending from the booth to him. Well, that's, yeah, you don't you don't even need to do it in the physical. I mean, you, mm -hmm. once the drummer's gone back home to his family, you can sit down and just you look at your tracks you and can compare look at it. Just and line it up. Yep, zoom in super tight. And what's nice about it is is you're not necessarily ruining the feel of mm -hmm. the performance. Yes. You're just nudging all the pieces so right. they play nice to each other. You're right. not chopping and, and attempting. You're, you're not either using a plug-in to quantize or quantizing manually, which... That's what really sucks the life out of stuff is that right. feel, uh, and that's what you don't hear in music anymore. I mean, people talk about the Motown sound; it was really made with equipment that wasn't that impressive, and in situations that were really kind of crazy compared to how yeah. things are done, I even in home studios right. these days. Yeah, I spent all day actually today listening to. I've got a, a Motown bass playlist on my iTunes with songs like Bernadette and uh, Superstition, Higher Ground, and a bunch of Temptation stuff, and I mean that was all. 
if I remember correctly, that was all recorded live. Everybody recorded at the same time. Pretty, pretty much. much. Um, if they needed to redo something, they did. But if they didn't, you know, there's, you go back and you listen to some of that stuff and it's not, it's not perfect. And that's, that's one of my favorite things to listen to. Like, the bass player will be dead on, but the, maybe the drummer's dragging behind. You know, well, probably on purpose. I mean, that was yeah. that's the whole Detroit sound. Is that, right. you know the snare's dead on, but the kick drum's deep in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So you know, half of every measure, you're you're right on top of the beat, and the rest of it, you're sliding back. Um, but like everything, you know, with every rule, there's you want to follow the rules always, always until you don't. So like right. there are there are times that you do want to, you know, dial everything right down to the microsecond. Like if you're tracking Meshuga, right, you know, it, like it a, needs to a be sick, yeah. rhythmically oriented. I've seen fast-paced metal band. You know Brian Brian Morrow Close, uh, who's been on the podcast before, and I don't know if he's written posts or not, but he'll you know you'll see pictures from him aligning everything. And it looks like it's dead on, but he's like, nope, I've still got work to do. This this requires it to be on the millisecond. Mm -hmm. It needs to be perfect right on there, or it's not going to sound as tight as it does when they're live. Right. You know, which they, if you're looking at, I mean, in Brian's sessions, you're looking at five, six, eight tracks of just kick drum. Right. And then you've got a pair of guitar players who are probably both six or eight tracks wide and a bass pl right. player who's at least three tracks wide. And, then, and if they're going to all come down on one, I mean, that, guys that play that kind of music are usually pretty good musicians right. anyway. But for it to really sound right, it does all have to be and, within the millisecond right. for and everything that, to stay and, then, and not uh, be mush. You see stuff like from my buddy's band, The Rain Kindo, which all of us know. Um, they've got their... It's, they use one kick mic, uh, two snare, tom on each, overheads, room mics, and then a mono room mic, and one bass track. And if that's if that's all you need, you know, I see a lot of guys, like, I, I even tried, I've got a uh, Ampeg SVT 810 sitting in my office, and I tried tracking with it, and honestly, the best bass tones I've gotten are out of, right out of Pro Tools into the, the Sans Amp DI, and a touch, just a little bit of the, the SM57 on it. Like, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of what the, the Beta 52 or the D112 sounds on it, but just with that, it gives it just a, a, a nice amount of click right on top where you can differentiate between what the bass is and what, what the whole track is. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I want to uh, not push too far into studio time, but... Um so I kind of, <laughs> I was trying to designate this as the live sound thing, but anyway, I don't know how much time we spent on on studio stuff. Um, but I would like to stick with time alignment. Uh, Carl, being a system designer, uh, he's got a lot of knowledge in that department, and he's seen firsthand how that can really make or break the system in a space. Um, and actually, one thing I want to, I'd, I'd love to just pick your brain about about how you set up a system in a space and how you design for that. Something that came to mind, though, since we're talking about drums and we're talking about time alignment, um, I wrote a post a little bit ago, I'll see if I can link to it, about uh, is it worth delaying your system so that the drums, your live drum sounds match up with what's coming out of the mains? And I would say in a small room, uh, which is where I got my start, you know, in places that, that held, you know, probably fewer than 500 people in most instances, but even in, in bigger rooms, um, I don't know, up to maybe 800 or 1,000 cap, you are going to hear some live drum sound like the bigger the room gets it might be you know just snare and cymbals that that you would hear loud enough to to make a difference in the system it depends on the program the band or whatever it, you know things are different whether it's metal or jazz right. but um you know the the stuff that i was reading and my thoughts were like yeah it definitely does help i mean if the even if you're on a tiny stage in a small room if your drums are you know 12 or 14 feet behind your mains that's 12 or 13, 14 milliseconds of delay difference there. And uh, it's pretty subtle, but it does tighten things up to yep. do it. And it's quick. I mean, I, I didn't even get my tape measure out a lot of nights. I just, you know, count sheets of plywood on the stage or, you know, toss out a, a mic cable of a known just length. Just walk or, it out. Yeah, walk it out or even eyeball it. I'm, I'm at a bit of an advantage because I grew up a carpenter. I've got a decent eye for, uh, if it's under 20 feet, I can usually eye it to within three inches. <laughs> but, um, even in larger venues, once I got to think of it, I, and uh, from reading some of Dave Ratt's stuff, this confirmed it. On larger stages, you know, you've got the drummer sitting there with a pair of Texas headphones, where he's got you know two 18s on either side of him and a, a three-way top cabinet on either side of him, uh, or possibly behind him, pointed directly at the audience. That's, that's going to contribute significantly, <laughs> especially to the people in the near field. Right. Um, so it's it's worthwhile taking a look at that because that's a significant source of sound, like possibly even more than what live amps are doing on stage. 
you know, if, if the two guitar players both have walls of marshals, but they're not real, and what's really mic'd up is the Fender Super Twin out behind, <laughs> then... Uh, Thank you, Kiss, for that. that um, yeah, yeah, a little that revelation. Uh, industry tidbit. There's the, t- the two guitar sounds you hear on most Kiss live stuff is on, on one side of the stage behind the wall of marshals. It's a, a Fender Twin uh, the other reverb, side, it's and it's a, a Fender Super Twin reverb. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah, Fender Super on the other side, and it, I mean... That one one of the worst times I ever had was at a, a, a Christian festival that we've got around here called Kingdom Bound, and I uh, I was helping out with production, and they just hand me a bunch of cabinets. They hand me three, four, eight cabinets per side, um, and I didn't I just didn't pay attention to what was labeled on them. I didn't pay attention to the one that said loaded and the one that said live, or I'm sorry, the one that said loaded and the one that said dummy. So I just kind of stacked them. I was like, all right, well, flat cab, slant cab, just stack them all up. And, and the guitar player started complaining. And what it turned out to be was they just had these walls of Marshall cabinets that had nothing in them at all. Mm-hmm. They're just, you know, stage presence. Um, and I, you know, I, I was younger. I, I mic'd the wrong cabinet, so they were only getting half the signal that they, that they thought they were getting. Um, but, it, but, that's that's a big part of giant, you know, not giant, but mid-level stage performance. If you're performing for 2,000, 3,000 people, and you've got, you know, eight cabinets per side, but only two of them work, that's that's a big difference. Yep, and that's and, that's, and so then that game. drum fill, which is, right. you know, compared to the couple of hundred-watt guitar amps that are actually working, a couple thousand watts of Texas headphones back in Drumland... Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, that's a significant contribution to a, a rig that's maybe sixty, eighty thousand watts total. Right. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was out with Catch, the first time I came across this, and I explicitly from that day forward wouldn't allow a drum fill behind the drummer again. Um, you know, we we didn't really get a sound check, and uh, by the time I got out to house, they're already monitor checking for the band, so the drummer's hitting the kick. And it sounded like it was already coming through the PA at about 95 dB. But it wasn't. The channels were muted. And I'm bugging the house guy. I'm like, these channels were muted. Why is the kick coming out of the house? He's like, it's not coming out of the house. And it was coming out of the um, EV MTL horn-loaded boxes <laughs> with uh, whatever matching sub was behind it. And those are horn-loaded boxes. So, I mean, it was just killing me. Um, and it really affected the sound of the kick in the house. Um, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, I had 10 minutes to get through the rest of my line check and start the show. So I was not about to ask the system engineer to measure and delay it. You know, we just went with it. Um, I think getting back to that original thought, John... I think it comes down to, well, how audible are the live drums in the room? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I remember when I had your gig um, with certain drummers, they hit harder, and that sound came off a lot hotter than it did with other ones. So I got in the habit of measuring from the snare to the lip of the stage and kind of using that as my starting point for delaying the rest of the system. And I, I think it... It made a dig a big difference with the snare, at least you know, coming through the right way, and everything else. Yeah. You know, the the guitar amps were isolated. You know, the the vocals weren't real loud. There weren't a lot of wedges, but um, it made it made that difference with the drums. My method in that same room now, and I I haven't implemented it yet because um, things keep breaking, and I keep not getting to the system <laughs> tuning that I want to do. Although. Improvements are slowly and surely happening. What we have is a very wide room with a flown PA. It's flown, I don't know, roughly 40 feet above their heads. Um, But uh, my method, once I do get to finally properly setting up the delay in there, is I'm going to go out in the house with a laser and shoot from a position in the seats to the center cluster, which is the, the driving force. There are some fills flown up there, too. But the driving force for everybody in the room is the center cluster, um, so I'm going to shoot that number with a laser and then also shoot to the drums. Although now my drums aren't centered anymore. They're off to one side. But I have a shield and I have some soft goods. So, mm-hmm. um, But that is going to factor into the to what I do for delay in there, too. Yeah. And uh, since we got into guitar cabinets... Well, hold on. Let me oh, no, no, put one ahead. more thing on that. You know, 
even outdoor stuff, um, you know, if you're providing sound for a show, you know, at the local um, band shell or something like that, a lot of those are made to project on amplified instruments. So when you get into a rock band on, you know, a band shell trailer or a permanent band shell structure, um, pay attention to that time alignment when it comes to the drums. Um, you know, it might really improve it because, you know, people don't always think of it, but the sound comes off pretty hot off of those things. Mm-hmm. Unless um, it's 100% isolated. Yeah. That, you know, like, that that's the one thing that I've got going for me is that our drum kit is 100% isolated. We've got a nice big drum shield that we bought from somebody, but it's it's all enclosed in brown board. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's very little, like you might get a touch of, of snare hit if somebody's really nailing on it. But unless unless that's the case where you don't have to worry about that, time alignment really, really does come back to Which it. Which begs the question, why bother having the drums then? <laughs> but <laughs> we used to have, we used to have, uh, it's up in my office now, we had, we had a, uh, a Rollin V drum kit for Ugh. the longest time. But the, the problem with it was... We had the V drums, but we had live cymbals, which yeah. is almost backwards of what you would want. I'd, I'd <laughs> honestly rather have electronic cymbals and real drums than <laughs> than what we had. So they had, you know, uh, blockades in front of the drums, which weren't producing any sound. But your live hi hat crashes, rides, splashes, all that garbage was just shooting out and the, bleeding the, into the fourteen vocal mics. <laughs> yeah. Right, and the yeah. choir mics that were hanging from the seat, all that yeah. garbage. Yeah. Um, and it, like, we couldn't control it at all, so we finally bought a uh, plexiglass drum shield from somebody. It, it helps a lot, but it, it also takes away from the feel. Like, you can't gauge what the drummer's playing from the vocalist because there's that at least separation. Right, yep. yeah. You've got, you got a 250 millisecond delay from the stage back to the desk, back to the Avion unit that the drummer's listening to, which... No, really? Not that long. Maybe not that long, but... That's well, an eternity. No, it, it, was, it, was, it, it, it used That's to be like that way note. because they used to be... Uh, it used to run from downstairs up to my office, upstairs, back downstairs, because they would run the recording from there and run the click from my office. Hmm. I, I fixed that real quick. Like <laughs> I think in the first two weeks <laughs> that I worked there, I was like, what, yeah, but what, not what are much. you doing? <laughs> I mean, the converters and the Avions would slow it down a hair, but I can't believe it's that long. It was pretty bad. Like, you had, you had to play behind the click a lot to to be able to match up with what was coming out live. Schnikes. It was it was pretty pretty bad. So we, we scratched that whole thing, and we'll use it for, uh, if we're recording, we'll, we'll absolutely use the Avions, because it's, it's a nice quick fix to 32 tracks live up to my office as opposed to mixing off the live desk which I've got a not volunteer but paid staff member that's not I, I would say not competent 100% <laughs> into what he's doing alright uh, so moving on then the uh, the other thing that I wanted to cover since Anthony brought up guitar cabinets is uh, dealing with that on a live stage and uh, you know everybody's dealt with that band that comes in, some young bucks who have got their first show in what, what they think is a big room, so they feel like it ought to be arena loud, and they, they crank their half stacks in a room that holds 150 people. That, or whole stacks. That on, <laughs> yeah, that only actually has 15 people in it. And uh, then you deal with that landscape mm-hmm. after everybody's knocked down. Right. Um, the thing that's really killer about guitar amps is, you know, people think in terms of wattage, like, oh, it's only a 50 watt head, so I can crank it up. <laughs> but here's all, here's the thing: all the big amps that you hear on all the Van Halen records, they're all 50 amps. Right. That they're not big, hundred, two. They're they don't stack all those things. Yeah, but even a 15 watt amp can really balls, make your day miserable. Man. All right. Well, let's let's the get... reason. Is it going to be a history lesson? Because that's where I want to go with it. Well, you, do I'll, I'll do the tech and then that. you do the history. So okay. the, the reason that guitar amps of small wattage can overpower PAs of larger wattage is that uh, it has to do with the, si- the physical size of the driver, the, di- the diameter, and at what point in the frequency spectrum those drivers can begin to control the directionality of the sound. And that's, So basically what that means is lower frequencies 
are the wavelengths are much larger than the driver, so they are sort of either omnidirectional if they're very low or not very directional if they're sort of approaching the size of the driver. But once you hit wavelengths that are about the same size as the cone, things get very directional very fast. Yep. And that's right in the mid-range, yeah. right where the voice of the guitar is, right where the size of those speakers and are. It, and it starts hurting. It hurts. A little bit in the small room especially. And depending on where that guitar amp is pointed, I mean, you can have people, you know, separated by 20 feet horizontally in the audience. One of them's getting creamed by the guitar, and the other one can't hear it at all because it's not in the PA. Um, so the solution, and I'll let Carl go off onto the history in a second, the solution is to, if you have guitar players showing up, and you can either tell that they're going to be loud or, I, I, you know, for like, battles of the bands, I almost insist on it. Like, I don't care if it doesn't look like rock and roll. Side fill it. Put your guitar on the side of the stage <laughs> shooting across. That yep. way, when you strike your first chord and your bandmates all start bleeding from the, you know, eyes, ears, mouth, nose, and other piercings. Other orifices. Any, any piercings or whatever. So when your bandmates realize how directional and how painful that sound is, you get a lesson on turn that shit down. <laughs> um, or, I mean, I've seen bands that, you know, that travel with a, a BE, with a band engineer, uh, festival stages, uh, December Radio was one. Yeah. Uh, it was my first exposure to it. I was at a, uh, you know, a trailer stage at Kingdom Bound at the local big summer Christian fest. These guys showed up, flipped their Marshall cabinets facing the parking lot, moved the mics around at the back. You know, they had the back sides of them done up nice with their name stenciled on there or whatever. Um, but the, the marshals went blasting off into the parking lot. The sound guy was able to perfectly control the mix and it was, they had one of the best sounding mixes of the day because there was zero competition between that very beamy directional sound you're getting off the amps on stage and what's going on with the PA. So that's, if you, if you have an engineer that you can trust or that knows what he's doing, yep. you know, it's all this, all this now. I've actually had kids say, <laughs> this is a bit of a side tangent, but like, not want me to put a microphone in front of their the speaker on their amp because they didn't want to block any of the you know the, two, <laughs> the, the magic juice any of the juice the, the goodness <laughs> you know that my fifty seven was going to get in the way of it and you know couldn't couldn't they just turn up and have it not be in the system at all? But, <laughs> sure, you can do that. But I digress. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into history and then we'll, we'll get into my my story that'll actually start tomorrow. Over to you, Carl. His, history it up. So. Back in the day, you know, the guys, the rock and roll guys, they had their 25 watt amps or 20 watt amps, whatever. And they were fine for the clubs of 100, 150, you know, and that's, that's how, that's how big the venues were. Well, after time, the venues got bigger, but the PA technology did not grow as fast as the audiences did. So, they were having a hard enough time just, you know, getting the vocals heard in the entire venues. And the guitar players were saying, well, hey, they can't hear me either. I can't get so, the tone that I want out of... No, not even tone, just sheer volume in the, in the larger rooms that they were going into. So that's where people like Jim Marshall and, you know, Leo Fender and these guys uh, doing the amps started making them louder. You know, and, and the whole thing with um, the slant top Marshall cab, that was so that, you know, before the flat front cabinets, it just fired the sound straight forward. It hurt, hit the first three rows of people, and it wasn't really hurt in the back. So they made the, the slant top cabinet. It gave it a bit of a... About a 25, 30 degree right. shift. So it just kind of shoots up into the air a little bit, and it, you know, quote unquote, reaches the back of the room. I mean, it's, you know, reflecting off of the ceiling or whatever. But <laughs> that was the tool to solve that problem. That was, you know, that necessity was the mother of that invention. Um, you know, they started playing bigger halls. They needed louder amps because the PA technology just could not keep up with the huge demand of, um, you know taking care of the whole bands, uh, you know, the whole band being mic'd and, and put into the mix. So now that the PA technology has caught up and exceeded that, there's not really a need for that anymore. And, uh, you know, so it, it's cool to have, you know, a 100-watt amp or, you know, to hot rod your old plexi or whatever, but there's really no need for it anymore. I, You know, I'm a guitar player. I'm not going to say that there's 
not a difference in the sound because I know that there is. I mean, I'm not naive about that, but I think uh, when it comes down for the quality of your show or your performance and what the average person thinks of the sound, you know, they're not going to care if you're playing through a 100-watt Marshall or a 50-watt Marshall. Yep. If your 100 water is making their ears hurt and they don't enjoy your show, that's a problem, you know. The PA is there, and hopefully the PA is set up in a way where everybody hears stuff equally in the audience. Let the PA do the work, and whether that's turning your cabinet around, you know, bringing a smaller amp, whatever that is, um, you know, maybe do the audience that service. Um, the amp I'm playing with now, it's a 30 watt Class AB, and it's got a switch on the back where I can knock it down to 15 watts. And it um, sounds awesome. It by, sounds by good, the <laughs> but there's a, but there's a definite tone difference between the 15 watt and the 30 watt. I lose some high end and some definition when I switch it down. Right. But you want to know what? It, it's not that big of a difference. I know the difference. My sound guy knows the difference. But nobody in the audience can tell. <laughs> as, as long as your front of house guy can compensate for right. just that, that touch of presence difference. Right. And it's literally a quick conversation during sound check. Carl, your amp's too loud. Oh, okay, I'll knock it down to half power. How's the tone? Well, it's not as bright. Okay, you know, I'll compensate for it on my end, and if he needs to do a little more on his, yep. you know, we take care of it. And, uh, you yeah. know, it's good. I mean, our gig Thursday, you know, our other guitar player, he's on an AC30. Um, things sound so good cranked. Mm -hmm. We can't crank it at 80% of the shows that we do, and it's a big struggle. So he struggles a little bit with his playing when it comes to that, because he's just not getting the... You ever think about an ISO box? Um, not so much an ISO box, but I'm trying to get him into a power soak. Yeah, like a, a THD, one of those. Uh, Lean in. Yeah, or speak up. Uh, there's <laughs> something along the lines. THD is. Do you of, have one of those? I don't. I, oh. I've used them before, but yeah. What, what's nice is a lot of times between, I've never used them on a, a, a combo amp, but a, a separate head and cabinet. You run it into a THD power attenuate, something like that. Where what it'll do is it'll take the 100 watts or the 50 watts. Um, and it'll knock it down, but it doesn't hurt your cabinet. Where if, if you're going from eight ohms straight out, you're not you're not hurting the cabinet by dumping it down a lot. And you're not driving it as hard, but you're still getting all the power out of it that you wish you were. Right. The, and the impedance stays the same. Really, right. It's just a big brick of capacitors, right? Pretty much. But we we did. Yeah. Me and John did a show like that at a club where these guys um, came in. They, who are they, I don't. They were playing. They were both playing Fender Strats with with humbuckers in the bridge. The one guy had a twin, um, uh, an evil twin, so he could knock it down to twenty five watts instead of a hundred. Then this other guy came with an old eight hundred head that he ran through one of these THD power plates. Mm -hmm. um, who was that? It was, it was at uh, something pine, Letchworth Pines. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah you but he did. It was this super deep. It was probably about almost. I want to say 18 inches deep cabinet with two tens in it, but it sounded like a wall of Marshalls, mm -hmm. um, and it, it pushed just as hard. But what was nice is that we could control the volume coming out of it. Like he he had what he needed on stage. We had enough wedges in front where it wasn't a big deal. He got the tone that he wanted out of it, um, but it wasn't super loud. But if he if he wanted to be loud, he took out the the power plate, and it just it those two tens just blew apart a whole room like probably would have cooked the PA um, trying to keep up with him right yeah like it, it would have 100% drowned out the vocals if he didn't have that power plate in between but he got the overdrive that he wanted out of that Marshall head this but is something that the the guitar amp industry has been wrestling with for a long time um, you know what really sounds good is when you're starting to saturate you know not just your preamp tubes but, but the your power the, when the power section right. tube and if, if it's a tube rectifier which is right. basically the power supply of the amp, you can saturate those tubes as well. And yep. that's where things start to get really expressive, where the, the Real compression that happens depend, is dependent on the level, like how much you're attacking the strings. That that nice 
Eric Clapton woman tone type thing. But there's so much coming to play. Research that's gone into it. You can get things called tone bones that you actually insert yeah. in the the tube sockets that mm-hmm. mess with the bias or something. I don't know what you can have your amp hot rotted, rebiased. Um, you can reamp, uh, which is what Eddie Van Halen did. Right. He would uh, he would come out of a cranked Marshall into basically a giant DI, which is like a huge pad of resistors. Took that sound. That distorted sound ran that through his effects processing and then out through a clean power amp, you know, a PA power amp, out to another cabinet. Um, and that's why his tone was, was and is so unique. Yeah, even, um, even though he's got a... I, I think when I saw him in December or January, they had he had something like 16 cabinets on one side of the stage just for him, but only two of them were mic'd. Mm-hmm. Really only one cabinet, just two mics on one cabinet, so... It might come down to just a bunch of dummy cabs. Yeah, could have easily been the only live one. Um, Another thing is just changing the impedance. I mean, uh, with with tube amps in particular, it's really important to match the impedance of your cabinet to the head properly because you can cook the tubes and a few other things. Or Um, cook or cook the 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 actual box that's coming out of. Yeah, you can you can cook a lot of stuff by doing that right. But if your amp's got a 16 ohm output. Uh, to where that output transformer is, is matched correctly to the impedance load that you're going to put on it with the speakers, you can get yourself a 16 ohm cabinet or build one or you know do whatever. So changing yeah. the impedance, going to a higher impedance will give you less output, but you can still be working that amp really Just hard, and, hard. Get, and getting yeah. that saturation that you want. Right. My, I, w- I was messing around with that with my amp. It's a 212 combo, and, and the what I love about it is um, I have... Two four ohm, two eight ohm, and one sixteen ohm output nice. on the amp, and it came from the factory with the speakers wired in series, so that gave me a sixteen ohm load. Well, I just for the heck of it wired them parallel, took it down to four, and that was my happy place for that, you know. Yeah. And going back and forth with it, it, it was you know cool to mess around with, um, you know. And I even disconnected one speaker and tried it eight ohms just to see what would happen and. Um, you know, really when you crank it, um, you, you notice a difference, but there, you know, if you got that really nice JCM 800, that vintage one that I'm jealous of that you have, um, you know, (laughs) sorry, invest, invest in one of those, uh, you know, Marshall makes one, I think it's called the power soak. Yeah. Power Um, break. Po- yeah, the po- Marshall Power Break, that's, THD that's, Power Plate is right. the two big ones. I least. think even Gibson makes one, too. Yeah. Um, you know, take a look at that. It's a couple hundred bucks, but, um, you know, it'll really, really just kind of make everybody happy around right. you. Right, yeah. and the, uh, <laughs> the one thing that I've really enjoyed is uh, two guitar players that I work with fairly frequently bought these heads from Splawn. And uh, like, a lot of other, like a lot of other hot rod companies, it's essentially based on Marshall technology which is essentially based on the 69 fender basement Basement. amp Mm -hmm. um but what they've done is they they built in an effects loop on it and and there's a lot of bells and whistles on it. i won't get into all of it but they can reach around behind that thing and there's a a, it's a loop volume knob but what it really is is a super effective master gain knob i haven't delved into the circuitry or anything to find out how it actually works but I'll, i'll never forget i may have talked about this before the first time i heard it we walked into a gig I was carrying something. I don't remember what it was, but first one, then the other hit a raging, gutsy, you know, low E power cord. And I, whatever was in my hand hit the floor. I turned around. <laughs> I picked my jaw up, and I was just like, new amps, huh? <laughs> and they said, yeah, is that too loud? And I said, yes, but I don't care. It was, it was, I, we'll, I, we'll fix that. We're not sponsored by Spawn, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple, uh, an evangelist well, for, for a couple company. people are. But, but so then they both go, hang on, walk over to their heads, they reach around behind, whoop, whoop, knob goes around, they both go cranking. I mean, it could have been like a two watt amp at that point, and it sounded the damn same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yep. so, like, the, that company in particular really spent their time. You know, you can dial in your setting. I mean, it was negligible. I, I, there were it, a lot of people really in the room is. that had really good ears. The, the, the tone change, cranking the volume from bedroom to stadium, is virtually undetectable in that amp it just um, it sounds like a wall of marshals either yeah. way like it because it goes like there there are three gears on it 
And that's, not, that's the stuff I didn't want to get into. Sorry. All right. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that it, uh, the times that it really works out are when you can work with a guitar player. Um, I had another band I worked with called Last Conservative here in the Buffalo area. Um, you know, Good one guy dude. had a, a matchless amp that he had uh, chopped from a combo into a head unit, and he played that on top of a Marshall uh, Slant 410. The other guy had a similar rig, but he had a, a vintage, I don't know, Fender and a vintage Marshall. And uh, so these, I mean, these guys were real tone samurais. Like, they were definitely, definitely into it. And it, it took me a long time to work my way in there to where they trusted me. But then what made it super great was we walk into all kinds of different rooms, and they just, you know, start hitting those chords, start toning out their rigs, turn to me out in the house while I was plugging stuff in, and like, Johnny, what do you think? Like, all right, well, you know, it's, I'm catching a lot of reflection today. Maybe, you know, tone it down a little bit or... Uh, you know, it's a mushy room. You guys can cut loose a little bit. And and they trusted me on that. And uh, what's more is they would take turns on each other's rigs when we had some time. They'd come out in the house and hear what their rig sounded like in the room unassisted. I mean, before I even had the the PA powered up. Um, and I think that's a, a shortfall. There's uh, sort of two things that I want to address. You know, one is this, this adversarial thing that especially guitar players have with sound guys. Like, yep. screw the sound guy. He's the enemy. Right. Um, I'm going to make sure I'm heard no matter what. But what they're hearing is, you know, a 410 cabinet blasting them in the back of the pant legs. They're not experiencing that, you know, that dentist drill effect <laughs> that 30% of the audience that's within the swath of destruction, you know, that their amp is beaming <laughs> out there. And, uh, you know, they, they haven't ever stood out there and heard what their rig sounds like in a particular room or in any situation for that matter. Um, so when, what makes it really nice is if you can work with somebody and if, and if they're willing, you know, if they're not so married to their tone or if they're not so married to the idea of their tone, I find, well, a lot of what you get is like the, the brazen example is like, oh, well, I have a Telecaster and a Fender Tweed. I sound just like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Right. Well, no, you don't. Like right. they're, they're, Stevie Ray Vaughan was 12 amps and 24 mics in a very special room. <laughs> right. You there, know, there, there's a guy that I work with, um, I haven't worked with recently, but. His name's Will. Will is one of the biggest um, Nashville and L.A. session players. Carl knows him. Yeah. Like, he is, he's a monster. I want to quit every time I see right. him play. He's, he's one of those guys that he just plays one note, and it, it defeats everything you've done the last decade type of guys. And he's got this, this handmade, it looks like a Fender Tweed, but it's not. It's all wired with, you know, precious metals and gem. <laughs> There's a diamond on every circuit type thing. <laughs> and it's only 15 watts, but he cuts it down to triode mode. So it takes down to Seven like... Seven and a half. Right. But it's still <laughs> it's louder so than the entire PA. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, what it, it's, a, it's a Midas Venice series of Verona and just, uh, I think, some kind of wide line array where it, it sounds unbelievable. Like, it's not a tone that you want to squash at all. But at the same time, I've talked to him. He's like, oh, yeah, I sandbag like nothing. Like, <laughs> he just, he like, he plays at half volume the whole time. And then as soon as the show starts, he just, oh, look, my volume knob has halfway more to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's, it gets really hard to, to try and control that because he's such he's such an amazing guitar player. And he's got flawless tone. Like, he he's played at the Grammys. Like, he's played with Bonnie Raitt when she was real big in the 70s. He's, there's nothing wrong with the way the guy plays. He just, he's that guy that has that issue with the sound guy that, well, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make sure that you can hear me when really it comes down to, no, trust me, we, we want to hear you, but there, there's still that, that issue in between sound guy and guitar player. Yep. Check how we're doing Sorry for the time here. That was a little off. No, that's all right. That's all right. We still got some time. Got a few minutes left here in the evening. Um, the same thing applies too, though. Is you know the levels that guitar players are going to bring to the stage to bring it back into the the sound realm, and particularly the providers of PA. Um, there's that same attitude, you know, like where you see a guy who shows up for a festival date loaded for bear, and for whatever reason the festival's under attended. So you know the he came expecting a crowd of 5,000. Instead, he's working for maybe 300, but none of them are anywhere near the stage because he didn't adjust his volume appropriately. Or, you know, the same guy that'll bring 15,000 watts to a bar that holds 150 people and isn't willing to budge an inch on, you know, where he has his, you know, the subs are going to be redlining no matter what. And, uh, 
that's why sound guys have a bad name because we do stuff like that. We make it impossible for patrons to enjoy themselves at a show. Um, I just did a show a couple weekends ago for 1,200 people on four QSC pole speakers with a couple of subs underneath them, and everybody loved it. Like people could get right up close, and it would be rock and roll loud right there, and they could rock their faces off right in front and, and feel like they were getting that rock and roll experience. But the vast majority of people there didn't want to dance and didn't want to have rock and roll up there in their face. They wanted to be able to, you know, order a beer and a, a plate of pulled pork in a somewhat normal voice and talk to their buddies that they haven't seen and, you know, uh, have the the outdoor beer garden experience. And so we we catered to that. And, uh I, don't know, I just I want to always encourage people in our line of work to just not be so full of yourself and and you know what you can do and what you know you know uh, tailor what you're doing to the people you're working for and the and the clients and the customers ultimately the ticket holders what they want out of the performance um, you know if it's a a shred fest and everybody shows up with their Ingve Melmstein shirt on then go ahead let the guitars be obnoxious <laughs> like, you know, that's that's what they paid to see. Uh, Anyway, I, don't, I could give examples all night. I, I just encourage people to, to tailor the the experience that you give to the the client, the ultimate client, the the cash paying ticket holding public, uh, but also to the musicians that you're working with. You know, even if it's the first and possibly the last time that you're working with a, a band, you know, give them that impression that you care. You know, that you are asking them to turn down, but let them know why if you can. Uh, you may not catch any traction. You know, with uh, some of these guitar players who consider you the enemy no matter what, because they, I mean, that's, not many people formulate that opinion based on, you know, lore that was handed down from guitar players of ages past. They've probably been burnt, and probably pretty badly, by not just one, but many sound guys in other places. So it, it is an uphill battle. But, uh, you know, even if you're just one person contributing to the good, you know, maybe the next sound guy down the road will have an easier time with that guy. And ultimately what it comes down to is, I mean, you know... If a guitar player is doing something that makes them sound bad in a room and you, you try and tell them how to remedy it, maybe you'll win this argument and maybe not. You know, like If their friends come up to them at the end of the show and say, man, your guitar sounded horrible, maybe they'll start to think that uh, you knew what you were talking about and they might be a little more open-minded next time. Or they might just blame you for it and open another beer and yep. you continue to curse your name as they walk out of the club. But, uh, you know, it's really it's a service industry, so you gotta you got to just take your lumps and do your best, I guess. One of, one of the things that I'll be dealing with this week coming up is uh, at the church I work at, we're having a, a kids' camp, you know, vacation Bible study type thing, but they do, they got bounce houses and all kinds of garbage, but the band they've got coming in is, um, there's some decent guys, you know, they some of the guys have actually played in a bigger MTV type bands, uh, Cute is What We Aim For, and a couple other ones, uh, which I, I didn't like, but anyways, they've got in... Uh, a gymnasium type setting, full drum kit, two guitar cabs. Uh, I think they're using my Ampeg A10 for bass and stuff like that. But it's, I think it, the room is about 65 feet wide and about 200 feet long. It's a, it's a full Olympic sized gym uh, or basketball court rather, but it's all concrete blocks. So I've got one guy coming in with a Fender Hot Rod DeVille 410, which is only 60 watts. Mm, mm, mm. And a guy coming in with a Marshall JCM 800, only 50 watts. But that, you know, th th that decreased power setting is really kind of, it messes with you. Like, oh, it's only 50 watts. It's not that bad. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I worked with these guys for three years. And the only way to control um, sound, especially for a bunch of kids that, you know, start at age four. That and don't like volume. That don't like volume. Especially their parents. Right. Their parents do not like volume. Um, you know, I try and keep it around. I, I still think it's a little bit high, but 95 decibels is where I can be comfortable with it. Where I can, you know, the drums are in a cage, the bass is toned down. I've got enough wedges on stage where they can hear themselves. But, but still, even with quote low powered amps, those amps cut through like nothing. So I've got a side film and. I think I might actually pull out the ISO boxes. I've got some plywood stacked with some egg foam uh, that our friend Jeremy made. Um, and that's still, you know, the bleed, the back bleed from that bouncing off concrete blocks still knocks out the vocals in most most scenarios. So I've, that's that's my battle this week is to try and figure out how to get two really nice amps, but 
somewhat loud amps to, to play nice with an, an entire room with 300 kids or how many kids we got this year um, and the full band so they don't feel like they're detached from from the stage setting to to what's coming out in the house yeah. cool well we're uh, we're getting a little bit low on time and uh, I don't want to run out here before I get a chance to ask Mr. Maciag about uh, I'd like to go back to time alignment and mm -hmm. uh I don't even want to know anything specific, but I maybe you want to tell the story, or maybe you got something else. Um, I don't know, it was a year ago, maybe a little more. You were talking about a, a particular church, uh, old school church, cross shaped room, you know, with naves and a nave and uh, whatever, but high ceilinged stone, domed, arched, uh, <laughs> your basic nightmare. All the all the awful things that you come across in one setting. Right. Yeah. So yeah, basically a, a a perfect storm of awful to try and deal with. Uh, but he came up with a solution that worked really well in there, made a night and day difference. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that, or maybe just the concepts that that went into that. And sure. Well, with where to start? Really, the type of system depends on what the material is going to be going through it. This one is, um, you know, predominantly speech. You know, they have a pipe organ. Um, at one of their masses, they actually have. Um, a gospel choir that's actually really good, like a nice 50 piece gospel choir with, you know, pianos, a, a trap drum kit, you know, a guitar, I think maybe a bass. And, um, but, you know, it, it's a lot longer than it is narrow. You know, I, I want to say that from the uh, altar to the back of the house, I think it was around 108 feet, but it was only maybe 22 feet wide. I mean, pretty narrow um, maybe 30 feet wide but you know whatever um, acoustic treatment was a dirty word because they had spent millions of dollars restoring the church to its original stone hard surface beauty and I couldn't argue with it because it's a gorgeous room um, so instead of having a big PA throwing energy into the walls and the floor at high amplitude. Um, I did a, a bunch of fill speakers, basically. I, di I didn't even go with, you know, a larger main front of house speaker with smaller supplemental fills. I went with the same... The whole rig was The fills. whole rig was fills, basically. And I divided all the different places of the sanctuary into different zones. Um, you know, there was a pair of speakers to the immediate left and right of the altar. And then I think it was every 21 or every 23 feet going back through the house was a new set of speakers left and right on the walls. Um, and what that did was it didn't require a lot of energy to reach the end of the zones. I was able to angle all the speakers so that, you know, the... You know, the, uh, the delays picking up where the next one left off was, you know, it made a lot of sense. And the zero point for all of these speakers were, uh, were the, was the altar, was the zero point basically, where the, there was a lectern mic on each side of the altar and that was the zero point. Did you, uh, did you, uh, negative delay the drum kit? No. Of, or, no. No. That, how that worked and that that wasn't a priority to them because okay. they have four masses on the weekend it was the last one it's a well attended mass but it was just you know that's that's not a big priority and the drummer was not loud at all you know okay. that that wasn't an issue so how that worked was they had a you know 16 channel mix around stage where the keyboard, the guitar, I think a drum overhead was the only thing, and the choir microphones were submixed and then sent, you know, into uh, the system that I installed. Um, used the tape measure, measured everything out, delayed it, checked it with my ears, and, you know, everything was nice and peachy. Things were intelligible. Um, something that was interesting, though, that... Um, we ended up doing that I didn't think would work, but actually ended up working really good, was off on the two, I guess you would call them naves, to the side of the altar up front. 
you heard, you could localize the sound coming from the pulpit, but because there was also, um, you know, if you were sitting on the one that was house left, the rest of the church was to your right side. So you heard the 108 feet of reverberation competing with, you know, the speaker coming at you from the left. And it was really distracting um, that your left ear heard direct sound and your right ear only heard reverberated sound. So what we did was, on the walls, um, on the walls, firing back towards the altar, we put up a speaker on each side there, fired it towards the audience, and then time aligned that with the speaker that was hitting the audience's left side. The right side was getting basically a, the same feed, time aligned and actually a little bit behind so that people's brains were localizing that the sound was still coming from their left side, but it was overcoming the, <clears throat> the reverberation that was happening in the room. Gorgeous. And that really, really helped a lot. And, you know, the client really appreciated it because, you know, to be frank, um, the people that donated most of the money for the project were the people that sat in that section. So, <laughs> there you, go. Um, you know, to be able to kind of make the money seats really sound great, um, really helped a lot. And, uh, it's been, you know, been back a couple times just to tune some things here and there. And, uh, you know, they bought some new wireless mics that are working out good for them. And, you know, just putting the sound where it needed to be and making sure it was all coming in the same time. That was, you know, really big. And, you know, the, the speakers that were 40 feet in front of the people in the back, they weren't hearing the direct sound, but it was still energy going into the room. And it was really important that that all, all that energy was time aligned, mm -hmm. you know, to help the intelligibility. So hopefully we'll be getting more projects like that in the future. So it was, uh, it was a fun one. Nice. All right. Well, we're getting pretty close on time here, but uh, covered a lot of ground this time. And um, as always, uh, if you heard anything that caught your interest, by all means, get in touch. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe you haven't stumbled across the blog that we write. Um, that is at smart the number two noise dot blogspot dot com. Smart to noise dot blogspot dot com. Uh, so you can track us down there. You can also find us. Uh, we've got a smart to noise page on Facebook. Uh, we are Smart to Noise blog on Twitter, and I just started a Google Plus page. Not that anybody's on there, but what the heck? For all the Google employees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If anybody out there, <laughs> out there on at one infinite loop or whatever. Um, so at any rate, uh, it, it was super exciting to finally hear from somebody, and uh, we may actually pursue that a little bit and, and see how things are going over on the continent. Uh, what else is coming up? Well, anyway, we, we could always we could use your feedback. Uh, we love it when we hear from you guys. Uh, even if it's just a quick like on Facebook, that's encouraging to know that there are people out there uh, paying attention to stuff. Um, but also, please don't be shy. Um, you know, if you're kind of young and getting started, definitely don't feel like we're going to look down upon you for a, any lack of knowledge. Uh, if there's something that you're curious about, we'd love to tell you about it and elaborate on it. And uh, if you are much smarter than we are, then uh, we're saying we're putting information out there that's misguided or incorrect. Uh, by all means, get in touch, straighten us out, because uh, we love to learn just as much as we love to teach, and we're all doing this for a living and, and striving to get better at it all the time. Um, shoot, I had one other thing I was going to say, but I kind of forgot it. At any rate, uh, we'll be back, hopefully, in another week. Uh, the summer season has settled down for a, a little bit here. Uh, July was a pretty busy month for all of us. Uh, probably have another end of August gets pretty crazy again and then you know back to school stuff gets crazy yet again but uh, and that's a good thing we like to be busy so uh, hopefully you have uh, appreciated what you've heard uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, sorry I just got a text right in the middle of that totally ruined my mojo uh, so that's uh, trying to do better about not rambling about this you're playing words with friends again aren't you yep <sighs> <laughs> Hmm, iPhones. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll we'll probably continue um, 
doing some live sound talk this summer. We've got a lot of good stories that we brought in. Like we, we can probably keep busy all winter just talking about the crazy stuff that happened in the month of July alone this year. Um, and I've got some stuff coming up at work. We're looking at new IEMs, new recording interfaces, hopefully some new microphones. That'll all be stuff to talk about. Uh, Carl and Anthony have always got stuff going on. And Gordon, whom we haven't seen in a while, may eventually surface from uh, his summer. He's been doing stage after stage and, and trying to cram in girlfriend land. A, a personal life. Yeah, he's he's still honeymooning with with a new lady friend, young girlfriend. So we're, we're letting him, <laughs> we're not giving him any grief for that. He works a busy enough schedule, but yeah, maybe we'll eventually get Gordon back in here. Also hoping to introduce some new faces here shortly. We've got a couple other sound guys in the area that are, you know, like us, frequently busy, but haven't been able to make it down here. So stay tuned. Uh, we, we won't be able to do this every week necessarily, but, uh, Let's see now. We've got it took 14 weeks to get our first piece of feedback in, so we ought to be good for for at least another 14. Ep no, 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 <laughs> that lets them off the hook. <laughs> we want to hear from you right now. We want to hear from you. So drop, get on YouTube, uh, post a comment, get on the blog, post a comment, send us an email, send us a, a tweet or a twit or hit us up on Facebook. whatever. Yeah, uh, it, anything you want us to talk about or you got some questions about or hey, you want to talk back to us about, really, we would love it. Yep. All right. So. Uh, have a good week, and uh, try not to die. Don't kill anybody if you're playing with electrics, on a, especially on a festival stage. Be careful in that rain. Make sure you're protected. Make sure the liability policies are in place. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. And brothers of the knob and fader, that is it.